Okay, so the next uh, next speaker is uh, Luc Hennen. Luc Hennen is an uh, engineer working already uh, several years for Dynafer Research Group. And he has a background in applied physics. He's from the uh, University of Eindhoven. Luc Hennen is going to uh, combine the experience that he obtained uh, while working for Dynafer Research Group in a project regarding vibrations. Uh, he's combining several project into this presentation in order to give an overview how to deal with those vibration problems in two-phase flow uh, lines. Um, all right, so, so well, um, it has been introduced already. My uh, presentation will be about solving vibration problems in two-phase flow line. This is a typical issue that we encounter uh, at Dynaflow Research Group. Basically, we have two situations. Uh, first of all, a, a client, a customer sees vibration in its piping, uh, is a little bit scared about it. Uh, it he knows he has two-phase flow in, in those systems, so he basically wants to know, one, okay, uh, how bad is it? And second of all, what can we do about it, of course? Um, the second situation is that uh, there was a failure in a, in a line in which two-phase flow uh, took place, or takes place. Uh, and he well, basically wants to know, okay, how can we make sure that it doesn't happen again um, without having to do too much about the, the actual process conditions. So the goal for this presentation for me is to inform you a little bit about uh, what type of situations these are and, and how you can uh, solve them, how you can approach them and then tackle the, the problems. And then really from, a, from an engineering perspective, uh, so also which difficulties, which engineering challenges do you encounter and how do these relate to answering, uh, well, basically the question of your customer. Okay, so before we go into too much detail, I just wanted to uh, quickly have some discussion about classification of flow-induced vibration in two-phase flow lines. This is an overview provided by the uh, Japanese Society for Mechanical Engineers, and they basically state three different excitation mechanisms um, related to two-phase flow. Uh, first of all, there's momentum fluctuation. I think this is the most uh, straightforward one. Uh, changes from gas to, to liquid cause uh, a force on, on bands, T's, uh, and uh, reducers. Second of all, they define thermal hydraulic, hydraulic vibration with phase change, uh, which, by which they basically mean boiling uh, condensation. Um, and finally, bubble-induced bubble vibration. Um, now, they also say something about uh, the, the fluid uh, structure interaction. So they define axial flow, by which they mean the flow on the outside of a tube, um, for, for instance, within a heat exchanger alongside the, the tubes themselves. Um, internal flow, this is uh, basically all types of two-phase flow within the pipe itself, causing a force from within. Uh, and cross flow, which is again, flow outside of the piping, perpendicular to the piping. Um, so uh, uh, also an example would be tubes within a heat exchanger. During this presentation, I'm gonna focus basically on these two, since these are the ones that we work with uh, most of the times. Um, so momentum fluctuation and then also internal uh, flow. All right, so these momentum fluctuations cause vibrations of the piping. Um, these can be problematic, uh, it can lead to different uh, types of failure, uh, as we will see. Um, and you can use different types of approaches if you see such vibrations just to, to handle them. Um, note that, that within this process, the engineering process of, of tackling these issues, it is always quite hard to know all the details of your, your two-phase flow conditions. Um, so that is always something to keep in mind during the entire pr presentation, okay, uh, why do, which assumptions have to be made uh, and, and how do you know what is actually going on in these pipes. All right, so I will start with some general characteristics of the two-phase flow within these pipes uh, and then discuss the engineering approaches and I will uh, illustrate these using a, a, an example of, of, of a project. Okay, so I think to most of you this is uh, uh, familiar. We have different types of two-phase flow regimes and these are uh, illustrated in, in uh, 
flow diagrams such as uh, the one shown here in which the vertical axis has some kind of measure related to gas velocity and the, ver sorry, the horizontal axis some kind of measure related to uh, the liquid velocity. Now if I use these illustrations, um, it clearly shows that if you have more gas in your flow, uh, a higher gas flow, you can go from uh, basically what I want to illustrate in this direction upwards and you can go from the uh, plug regime into slugging into finally the annular flow at the bottom. Um, and I think it is clear to say that, that from a vibration perspective and, and uh, looking at the force, sorry, the fluid structure interactions, um, slug flow is definitely the more severe one since you have the most uh, transition from fluid to gas and, and back. Um, now note that the slug itself is, is just not on this image, right? So here's a gas bell within the flow. Uh, and this, this uh, uh, liquid is actually the, the, uh, the slug which, which acts on, um, on the piping. <coughs> okay, so we, we um, separate two types of, of slugs, uh, basically terrain slug formation. Uh, I think this is also a little bit related to the, the, the previous talk. Um, gas, pre well, there's some fluid in, in the piping, and this is uh, a capture at the bottom of, uh, of piping which contains elevation. Um, and as soon as the pressure rises upstream, there's a point where it pushes the gas upstream, pushes the entire uh, liquid volume through the piping, causing a, a slug to go through your system. Different phenomenon related to slugging is uh, where you have uh, basically wavy flow and, and the waves uh, become such high that they uh, fill the entire cross section and lead to slug formation. Um, now note that uh, there are some differences with respect to the features of these lines. For, install, for instance, terrain generated slugs uh, can really have long periods in between uh, the, the, the slugging passing through your system since the, since the entire uh, upstream pressure has to build, be built up again before the slug is uh, moved through the system. This can actually be up to, well, let's say around an hour before again a slug moves through the system. Okay, so I, I can go through this rather <coughs> quickly since I think it is somewhat straightforward, but it is an important part uh, when you approach these slugging issues uh, from an engineering perspective. Um, so basically the forces uh, created on your, your piping are related to the momentum change. Uh, so you calculate them using the mass flow times the velocity, so you'll end up with uh, the, the fluid density times the cross section of your pipe times the uh, velocity of your slug. Uh, and, and the feature will look somewhat like this. Uh, there's a rise time as soon as the, the slug enters your uh, band. Um, and then there's a load duration as long as the slug is within the band. Um, so basically, we can say that if a slug passes through uh, such a band, you really get a hammering on effect on, on this band. Um, and the load duration obviously depends on, on your velocity uh, and on the length of the, the slug itself. Now if you have multiple uh, slugs through your system and you want to do calculations on this, um, you have to know something about uh, the period in between those slugs. Um, and, and making this force time history is always something that is a little bit tricky. You have to do some calculation, you have to do, know a little bit about what is going on in the system. Um, there are a lot of uncertainties, uh, uncertainties uh, right? What is the actual velocity of your slug? What is the actual velocity of your gas? Um, how large are these slugs within the, the cross section? Um, so basically, we, we calculate the maximum slug force using the conservative equation I've just showed you. Uh, and then we have to well, have some information, maybe from our client, uh, to know what type of forces we can uh, use for the calculations. Um, typically, the result is that you have 
quite low frequency vibrations within the order of 10 hertz, um, but with relatively high amplitudes. Forces, slug forces can really be uh, up to several kilonewtons, uh, obviously depending on, on the diameter of your pipe. Um, so this can also relate to resonance, uh, right? If you have a, a, a piping system, it has certain mechanical resonance modes, uh, and if the excitation force coming from your slugs is related, is, is in the same order of magnitude of these uh, uh, eigenmodes, you get resonance. It's always a little bit tricky to say uh, if you have resonance or not, since the excitation um, is not known in that detail, right? We also do work on, for instance, uh, compressors or pumps, and you really know in detail what the different types of uh, uh, frequencies are that, that are within the system. Um, obviously, a different magnitude, but you know what the frequencies are. And that is a little bit more tricky here. Um, so sometimes it is clear from, from say, uh, uh, measurements that you have resonance, and sometimes you have, have different eigenmodes uh, on, on different, uh, uh, excited in different times. All right, so next we'll have some discussion about the engineering approaches. Um, okay, so some systems are more uh, perceptive, perceptive to uh, slugging than others. I think uh, I won't go into to the upstream ones. This was uh, already discussed in detail, one of these examples. Uh, downstream, we really see uh, crude furnaces, uh, feed lines um, to distillation towers, uh, hydro and steam lines. So all type of lines in which you have quite violent two-phase flow. Uh, I think it's clear that, that the piping downstream of a crude furnace is, uh, is a very good example. Uh, so how can you approach this? Well, during the design stage, it is tricky, of course. Um, you don't have, you're not that sure if, uh, if slugging uh, will be a problem, but you can take some measures uh, to, uh, to, to reduce the risk. Um, there are some flowcharts available on this. This is one uh, from the Energy Institute. Um, and they basically help the designer uh, with, with certain steps he can take uh, and certain analysis he can do uh, to reduce the risk. Um, and basically what it comes down to is that you uh, want to make sure that you don't have, have too much eigenmodes, uh, too much eigenfrequencies. Well, below 10 hertz, I would say. So one first rough design approach that we sometimes use is, is discuss with the client, okay, let's make sure if we, if we design restraining on this system uh, that, that all eigenmodes with below 7 hertz, for example, or 8 hertz uh, are removed. Um, so then he already has some risk reduction with respect to resonance due to slugs. Um, and, and in the end, it is all about then uh, well, restraining and also choosing the routing and, and uh, supporting. Once you have chosen this, you can do a detailed uh, uh, mechanical response assessment, uh, but this has to be based on assumptions since you don't have any uh, measurements or, or details about the flow, obviously. Um, so in practice, we see, what I've seen at iFlow is that this uh, is not done during the design stage. However, what is done a lot is that uh, once it is operating or, or once they change process conditions uh, for a system, uh, slug formation can appear um, and they, they, all, well, they need to uh, take action. Um, this is again a flowchart provided again by the Energy Institute. So this uh, provides some guidance for, for the guys in the field. Um, and basically the first step often is to provide uh, vibration measurements. Um, so this is an example of vibration-based limits. This is a VDI uh, 3842. And you can see here that, that the uh, power spectrum, sorry, the, the Fourier transform of your vibration measurements show that one peak is, uh, is, uh, is, is present in, in the vibration. And that this, well, you can estimate if this is well bad or not. Uh, a little bit by these guidelines. So there's the VDI, you also have one by the Energy Institute himself. 
uh, and you have some literature available on this as well. Um, these, however, are pretty conservative since you don't have included any information yet about the geometry, what types of welds you are using, etc. Uh, etc. Et so this is just a, a first preliminary step that people often take if they see vibrations uh, within the piping to, to have some estimate about uh, how bad it is. In the end, you'll have to do a detailed mechanical response analysis uh, to really know what is going on and, and uh, which stress levels are uh, reached within your system. Um, so this is an illustration of an eigen mode uh, on the top, which can be removed by using the proper restraining. And these can be assessed once you have made the model and, and implemented the forces and obtained the stresses. Uh, this can be assessed using fatigue curves uh, to, uh, to see if the, the stress amplitudes lead to failure within time. Obviously, once you go through this uh, process, you'll have uh, an increase in cost, an increase in, uh, in accuracy also. Um, so basically, this is the way that this, you often see it. Um, and, and whether or not a uh, detailed mechanical analysis is done uh, totally depends on, uh, well, on, on the, the vibration-based limit. Um, but in the end, I think, you know, if, if it is kind of worse, it is always useful to do so since the cost related to such an ana analysis uh, will probably be much and much lower than, than any kind of failure within, within these bands. Okay, so that is the process that is used, vibration measurements, detailed uh, assessment of your stresses. Um, and that is the process that you as an engineer would want to go through uh, for such a project. Um, in the end, yeah, it always goes a little bit different than planned. Um, so this is a project, the figure on the right, um, shows a uh, basically a crude furnace. This is the convection section in which the crude is guided through uh, a section which is warm and then also through a radiated, uh, sorry, radiation section in which it is uh, heated through uh, 380 degrees. Um, and for this project, what you really encounter, okay, so we want to do this assessment, we see the, the vibration in this piping. Um, but it turns out there's no information on the, the current restraining, for example. Uh, also, these items really hang within on structures uh, within themselves. <laughs> so there's a lot of different um, uh, thermal expansion. This structure, the radiation section, is not just mounted on the ground, but it hangs within another framework. Um, so, so that information is often not always available. You really have to dig into that. For instance, you see hangers uh, on top, which uh, connect the interconnected piping from the convection box to the radiator section. Um, what are the details of these hangers? They've been there for a while. What is the quality? Uh, are they still uh, uh, doing what they should do? Um, so that is, that is something that you encounter in the first phase. And then next, you want to do measurements to, uh, to provide input for your calculations. Um, and you already see some, some preliminary issues, right? You, you, first of all, you have to get your equipment up there. Um, second of all, you have uh, insulation around your pipe. It's okay, that has to be removed. Can you reach the locations on which the measurement should take place uh, to obtain the right information? Uh, these are all issues that, that really make it e even more difficult uh, to, to do these assessments. Um, and of course, the temperature. This is an example of, of a uh, measurement on this system. This is a uniaxial uh, accelerometer on the piping. And we really have to use an additional magnet uh, to mount the, the sensor itself on the piping, since the piping would simply destroy the sensor uh, too fast due to temperature. And we have to wait for this, uh, this extra additional heat capacity to cool off again and, uh, and do the measurements this way. Um, so in the end, it can be quite quite a, a, a large invasive uh, process to, to get all the information on the table. What this system shows as well is a typical issue which you encounter if you do these types of uh, vibration assessments. Um, so 
you have a lot of thermal expansion going here. The routing is, the routing is quite complex. Uh, so what is done during the design phase is made sure that all the different thermal expansions have the flexibility and have this, the, the, the space available uh, to do so without causing any high stresses from a static point of view. Um, this means that you want to provide flexibility in your system. Uh, however, if you have two-phase flow and you have an excitation mechanism on your piping, uh, then that causes dynamic uh, uh, forces. Um, and the, the approach to avoid this is to really provide restraining and fixate all your piping. So that is always a, a check that you have to do. So on the one hand, restrain your system to avoid the vibration. So on the second hand, redo the static assessment and change your, your situation such, such that you uh, can deal with the, the, the expansion stresses. All right, I'm gonna do one example here. Uh, this was a fatigue failure due to slugging in a water feed line of uh, hydrocyanide with uh, uh, ammonia, a uh, hydrocyanide ammonia stripper. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the system, how we implemented the slug loads, and then uh, how we did the mechanical response analysis. Okay. Okay, so this is the system. We have the heat exchanger upstream uh, and then a feed line towards the stripper itself. Um, and, and looking at these, uh, looking at that section here, um, you can see, okay, there's quite some bands available, or, or sorry, um, present in this system. And also at the top section, you have quite some flexibility. Um, long section without much restraining, uh, no real axial uh, supporting. So that already uh, gives some information about that there will probably be uh, quite some angle modes uh, with a low frequency present here. Uh, within the band, uh, as I pointed, there, there was a failure encountered, um, a crack, a typical mechanical uh, failure, uh, sorry, fatigue failure. Um, so what uh, the first step what was done is, is uh, do these vibration measurements to see uh, what frequencies uh, are present in the system and also have some input for a detailed mechanical analysis. Of course here the, the assessment of these vibration amplitudes wasn't that useful since there actually was a failure and something actually had to be done. Okay, so what turned out is that there were some critical vibrations according the assessment of the vibration amplitude itself. So in the end what they did is uh, basically took the accelerometric uh, measurements, did the data analysis on it to obtain the velocity versus the frequency, and this was tested as uh, I described before using the, the uh, vibration based limits, in this case the VDI 3842. Okay, so this typical vibration, well, okay, marginal, okay, <laughs> gives some uh, concern, um, but, but wasn't especially uh, the, the cause, probably, of this failure. Um, so a detailed assessment had to be done. And in this case, uh, there was quite some information uh, from the customer related to the, the, the flow conditions. So we obtained the uh, actual slugging uh, parameters from them. Um, as said, the, the slug force here was around a few kilonewtons, and we applied the force on all these bands as shown here. Uh, and, and obviously this is the image I showed you before. Um, Okay, what we see is that uh, several of the eigenmodes that are present, they are shown here, are also within the uh, frequency range that was uh, found to have some critical uh, vibrations. Um, so this one is found at 4.7 Hz in the model uh, and 6.6 .6 Hz in the model, of course. Um, remember this figure uh, in which the vibrations as observed in the field are shown with these uh, red lines. This section was going upward and downward in that section as well. 
Um, now this horizontal section from the image is this horizontal section right here. All right, so in the field they found six to nine hertz, uh, a few different uh, vibrations, and that was already quite close to the, the eigenmodes that we saw in our model. Um, all right, so obviously you still have to tune the model with these vibration measurements, right? You have your vibration measurements, you have the displacement uh, available for certain frequencies. That is, that is what is measured, and then in your model you apply forces, and you see that certain eigenmodes uh, which are uh, uh, related to the measurements um, are, are excited. Um, however, you also have to make sure that the displacements uh, that you calculate from the model are kind of in the same order of magnitude as the displacement measured for these frequencies. So for instance, if this displacement uh, is, is only half of the displacement that is found at this frequency uh, in the field, that, that gives you some um, information about that your forces are probably higher. From these calculations, the uh, stress amplitude it can be obtained and can be evaluated in, uh, in fatigue curves. This is uh, the fatigue curve from the ASME uh, section, division 8, section 2. Um, these are the, the values that were found. You might say, okay, they are below the, the endurance limit, so, so nothing's going on, but you have to take into account the factor of 2, uh, since these were calculated using the P31.3 code, which uses different uh, stress intensification factors, so the, the base factor is, uh, is uh, different. Um, so a factor of two has to be applied and we see that we're getting close to the uh, endurance limit so that these uh, eigenmodes related to these stress amplitudes could actually be a problem. Okay, so then solving this is all a matter of changing your, uh, changing your routing or your straining um, to make sure that these eigenmodes that respond uh, the, the strongest to these excitations are gone. Um, as said, you have to do re-evaluate static stress uh, situation, um, and in this case, the, the client provided a, a clamp on this this leaking uh, elbow, right? It, it had to solve it uh, for the time being, um, and this is an additional mass in your uh, in your calculation. So for all these scenarios, with without, when is it going to be replaced? Uh, the calculation was was done and reported. Okay, so this is a typical approach that we as Dynaflow would use to avoid uh, and to help our customers avoid these uh, failures. Um, obviously, another approach is, well, okay, why don't you make sure that you uh, avoid the, the excitation force from the beginning? So, so just make, try to be in a different uh, flow regime. That can be quite difficult, also the process uh, 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 requirements have to be met, of course. Um, but bottom line, it is also much more invasive. So, for example, in this project, um, a clamp was provided, and later on, supporting was provided, uh, and during uh, the clamp was, was stayed at place until the next uh, sh shutdown. Um, if the solution would be, okay, provide a uh, orifice, for example, or something to make sure that your pressure is different, that your flow regime is different, uh, <coughs> then that is a much more invasive solution. All right, so finishing. Um, slugs can be, can be relevant for piping, often it calls for, uh, for uh, issues uh, for certain systems. And you can have multiple approaches uh, depending on, on the severity of the problem. Um, this will result obviously in, in some practical challenges. It, 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 it's not always as easy as you, uh, as the codes describe it to be. Um, and, and one of the challenges is also to match your model uh, with the actual excitation and, and vibrations uh, measured in the field. Okay, so I hope that that gives you uh, a little bit of an overview about how a dynaflow would approach these two-phase flow uh, problems uh, which cause vibrations. Um, if there are any questions, I would be happy to, to answer them. Thank you.